Buckle in, sports fans. You're listening to The William Haynes Show. The program will be starting in just a couple of minutes, so grab your popcorn and get ready to enjoy the show. While you're waiting, make sure you're following us on social media at WHBC Stream and staying tuned to WHBCStream.com. We're so glad to have you today on the program and we'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line on Twitter or call the show 352-639-0036. And thanks again for tuning in. HBC. Well, it is a good evening to you and how you be. William Haynes here, you there, here on this Wednesday night at 1035 with 19 seconds to go right along with it. We are talking tonight's 9-5 to Rays win over the Boston Red Sox. Of course, the Rays advance to 11-8. and The Red Sox Drop to 6-12. in 12. The Rays riding a nice little win streak. The offense continues to be hot. There was a little bit of a hiccup late with uh, a relief pitcher just trying to get innings and Aaron Sleggers. We'll tell you all about that. Also, Kittredge has gone on the 45-day injury list with a UCL sprains. Hopefully, no Tommy John surgery for him, uh, but he's going to miss some time, you would assume, the rest of the season after saving uh, what would have been uh, Monday night's game and opening Tuesday's game, and if you're listening, just tuning in now, I wanted to let you know that you can call the William Haynes Show at 352-639-0036 at WHBC Stream is the Twitter if you want to give us some thoughts on there as well. Again, we'll be taking your calls up until 1130, one hour program here. We're keeping it nice and tight. Again, the phone number to call is 352 639 zero zero three six also some some nhl action uh the nba is continuing to go down the stretch in its little regular season reset i'm not going to quite get into the inning by inning breakdown of the game i want to let the listeners uh, continue to flow in here and maybe take some calls here early in the program we had some calls last night and we thank you to everyone that listened and also called again the number to call it is 352-639-0036 as I buy a little bit of time. Uh, we're not going to hit it at 1040, but about, and we do have a call coming in right now. All right, we have a first time caller on the William Haynes Show. Who do we have the pleasure of speaking to? Oh, uh, yeah, it's uh, Stephen from North Carolina. Oh, Stephen, nice to talk to you. How's it going? Oh, it's going good, William. Hope you're doing well, man, after a nice Rays win there. Absolutely. Couldn't feel any better. The Rays uh, now have, I believe, five straight. They're 11-8. and eight. Uh, How do you feel about them right now? Uh, I feel like they're pretty hot right now, man. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Um, this series with Boston, I feel like, has kind of uplifted the team. Um, you know, their hitting was kind of suspect in the last couple of series that they'd had, you know, with the Orioles. Um, but I feel like this the series with Boston uh, it's kind of helped bring out their uh, their inner last year's team uh, if I can say that and uh, 
yeah, I think they're starting to find their strides like they were last year. So, Yeah, I would be a little cautiously optimistic because of the Red Sox. We know the pitching staff, but the way the offense has been hitting, like you said, it's undeniable. I would like to say that they're hitting their stride, and we may see that. They're going to be in Buffalo over the weekend and then next week early taking on the Yankees. So I think this stretch, this road trip, we're going to know what this race team is uh, by the time that stretch is over. Yeah, um, I would like to say, however, that uh, I do think that their pitching could use a little bit of holstering, I guess, or bolstering, however you want to pronounce it. Yeah. Um, with all the injuries that uh, have kind of occurred within the last week, it seems like um, I feel like maybe it would be time to call up, you know, a couple of uh, minor leaguers, perhaps, or maybe to just uh, sign, you know, a free agent that's kind of looking for work or whatever, you know. Um, just to kind of uh, ensure that their bullpen or whatever they might see uh, fit uh, to kind of get a win there perhaps or uh, just get through the next couple of weeks or months uh, just to keep their record in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point. And it's nice they have the 60-man at Port Charlotte. And I think that's what we saw with them today. Of course, Andrew Kittredge going on the 45-day IL. So they call up Aaron Sleggers, who has only made a couple of big league appearances, I believe, for the Twins, none for the Rays. And he got through two scoreless, and then he got dinged up a little bit. I think that's going to be the problem. They have guys that can get innings. But obviously, the Aaron Sleggers experience so far was a little bit scary, to say the least. Yeah, um, I will say... Sleggers did a very good job. I think it was the seventh that he came out. Uh, I don't remember if he did three up, three down, um, but he did phenomenal. Uh, and then the eighth, uh, you know, he got the three singles and then the, gave up the uh, grand slam there. Um, you know, I, I feel like he did, you know, uh, good for the inning that he was out. Um, but I think Cash might have just left him in there a little bit too long. Uh, I do think 40 pitches, you know, for relievers starting to get kind of up there. Is, you know, a lot of people might think that. But, um, yeah, uh, it's it's unfortunate, but the Rays still got the victory, and uh, I can't complain about that. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Aaron Slegger's getting a scoreless 6th and 7th, and he comes out to start the 8th. And, again, yeah, you can't crush him too much, like you said. It was a lot of slow-rolling singles. It was a... The the first hit that got it started maybe could have been recorded as an out. So, a pit, you, you know, you can't give Sleggers all the blame. But, yeah, the, the the grand slam to J.D. Martinez, and I think all us Rays fans were getting a little nervous. They said before the game that he yeah. was ready to go four or five innings. So he had that length, I guess, built up in Port Charlotte. But, I mean, a guy like that, yeah, two innings, I think they should have capped him off there. I, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, I will, however, give props to Boston. Uh, tonight, uh, Pilar seemed like he couldn't not hit a, a baseball there. Um, and a lot of uh, their lineup, um, I can't remember their names for sure, um, but uh, Pilar seemed to do really well. Um, seems like Boston has a couple of good hitters on the team, but the rest of the team's kind of uh, lacking in that department uh, per se. Um, but I do want to give props to the Rays also, however, um, the entire roster seemed to get a hit tonight, which was excellent. Um, but like you mentioned, uh, Boston's uh, pitching staff and and just the overall kind of department of pitching, I guess, isn't the greatest <laughs> right now for them. So, um, but you know, give and take a couple of hits, and uh, I think they're happy at the end of the day there. Absolutely, a win is a win, and hopefully, uh, the Blue Jays up in Buffalo, their pitching staff. Uh, isn't the greatest either. So hopefully they can keep that going. Thank you so much, Stephen, for the call. It was a great call. Please feel free to call back anytime. It was so nice to finally have you on the program. Of course, William. Thanks for uh, thanks for taking me, man, and I'll uh, get back on the line there to listen to you there. <laughs> All right. It was a pleasure. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks. And there he goes, Stephen from North Carolina. Again, Stephen, thank you so much for the call. We appreciate everyone that has called into the William Haynes Show the last couple of days. And if you're listening and thinking that you would like to do more of the same, the phone number to call is 352-639-0036. We'll be taking your calls uh, right up until about 1130. We'll take a break in about uh, 18 minutes or so give you some baseball scores tonight a lot of MLB action the standings are finally kind of getting themselves set 
as we are uh, getting to about, I believe, a third of the way through the season at this point. Some teams have played more games than others. The Rays, I believe tomorrow will have, they will have played their 20th game and they'll be officially a third way through the season. But of course, we have teams like the St. Louis Cardinals who have played five games, uh, the Marlins who have some games to make up. It's a little bit different for everyone, but we're we're coming down that stretch and the Rays that, that had a, a rough open to the season um i think finally getting their footing as dave wills and andy andy freed mentioned on the broadcast uh this this team hasn't necessarily hit its stride again and i and i mentioned this already on the show let's not get ahead of ourselves it was only boston we identified that this was the weakness of that ball club going into this season but a win is a win nine runs is nine runs they had eight runs in both of the last two games so the offense is red hot again the lineup it was absolutely fantastic. It was Austin Meadows leading off. He goes two for four with a walk. Also knocks in a run. I believe it was his solo home run. His first homer of the season. Four home runs in total for the Rays. Uh, they beat up the starter, Zach Godley. who only got through three innings, eight earned runs on 10 hits. Uh, you look further down the lineup. It was Brandon Lau, who's now batting uh, right over 300. He goes three for five today. Scores three runs. Knocks in two. So he's an asset um, at the top of that order for sure. I guess the right-handed starting pitcher, they go heavy lefty, and it works out. Yandy Diaz goes three for five with a run knocked in. So you think he's really hitting his stride. Not not really a lot of power off the bat from him yet. We've yet to see a home run, yet to see a lot of powerful line drives. Uh, but I think he might be coming into his own, seeing the baseball a little bit better. He's been taking a lot of pitches, but as I mentioned last night, if he can take the bat off the shoulder a little bit more and be aggressive, and again, three for five tonight. Uh, that's certainly good, the top of the order. And then we had G-Man Choi going one for four, a walk, and he scored a run as well. Joy Wendell went, went one for five, knocked in a run, struck out twice. And then Yoshi Satsugo, one for four. It was a two-run homer, uh, which was his, uh, I believe it was a, a solo shot. The, the run knocked in, I think, was on, on a ground, ground ball. But Yoshi Satsuga getting his second home run of the season, the first since opening night against the Blue Jays, which at this point is about uh, two and a half, three weeks ago. And it's something us Rays fans have been talking a lot about. He's batting only 160 uh, coming over from Japan. I believe we talked about this with Seth uh, last night is, you know, the, the question really has become, is he just a guy that is good enough to be an MVP level in the Japan League and, you know, may not be able to catch up to major league pitching? Uh, Seth mentioned to me that he had uh, seen more pitches than almost any other batter. Um, so you like what you see from there. Obviously, uh, he's a good ball player. He also had a very, very tremendous play. A nice diving catch in left field. That was also a concern was, is Yoshi a guy that you're going to have to DH? Can he play the field? A little iffy at third base, but so is Yandy Diaz. A nice platoon at third over there. Um, but then Sisu going left. Uh, some struggles early not necessarily with the errors but just doesn't have the big cannon arm and he's, he's not super fast but the diving catch was really good to see so really really good game for Sitsugo and I think that bottom of the order is exactly where you want him right now um, as he can give you that power can maybe get on base uh, I think right now is certainly a good piece at the bottom of the order as I said Willie Damas Went one for four with a run knocked, and he continues to do what he does. Also a good game over there at shortstop. Kevin Kiermeyer three for four, uh, no walks, one strikeout. He also had an absolute laser and assist. He now leads the American League in assists with four. He gunned down uh, Kevin Pillar, who tried to stretch a single into a double, and Kiermeyer with an absolute laser of a throw over uh, to um, Joy Wendell at second base to get the out and it was Michael Perez catching batting ninth he went 0 for 4 tonight with a strikeout so obviously getting the lefty bat against the righty starter of Godley uh, also had a little bit of a rough time over there at catcher uh, something that Dave Wills mentioned on the broadcast was he always seems to, he's a, a baseball magnet he always seems to get dinged up he got hit again like on the foot on the arm he had a little bit of trouble uh, getting down to block that's one thing I will say about Zanino a much wider frame as well and boys, and you know, a brick wall uh, behind home plate. He can really block some baseballs. But of course, I believe he's only, I think he's batting under 090 uh, right now. So uh, trying to get Perez in the lineup. Perez uh, is batting 176 right now. So I think Cash is going to kind of play that uh, platoon uh, against righty starters. You put the lefty Perez and against lefty starting pitchers, you do the righty Zanino um, if they want to do it halfway split. Uh, but something that I, that I talked a little bit last night, something that I guess 
it's easy for us to forget. Uh, Kevin Cash, uh, the manager of the Rays, of course, he had a a long, a somewhat long career as a player in the major leagues, was a journeyman, and he was a catcher. So obviously, he's going to know that catcher position best. He understands the value of a catcher that knows the pitchers well, which is something that no one in this Rays system uh, can deny. That's one of his his best attributes. Is he gets to know all the pitchers and the staff. Uh, he, obviously, he calls games. Uh, good. He knows the pitchers um, and, he, and a good backstop. So, of course, Kevin Cash is going to see the value in that and going to give him extra chances. The Rays give players more chances than other organizations already. But you add in a catcher like Zanino, who's so good defensively. Um, and, and, of course, he's going to get all those extra opportunities. Michael Perez uh, going 0 for 4 with uh, some defensive miscues. Not necessarily to his credit, but it is not. The Michael Perez era is not over by any means. We're still going to see him, I think, mainly against right-handed starters. Um, so uh, that that was the lineup again. It was Meadows, Loud, Diaz, followed by... Uh, it was Choi, Wendell, Sitsugo, and at the bottom it was Adamas, Kiermaier, and Perez. <laughs> Having a bit of a difficult time reading the statue there. If you're just t- tuning into the program, uh, you can call the, the William Haynes Show. Get on the air live and talk to me at 352-639-0036. We've already had a caller, and we thank uh, Stephen for giving us a call. A lot of good thoughts from him, as I'm sure a lot of you other race fans have some great thoughts as well. So please give me a call 352-639-0036 about 10 minutes away from the break. So uh, with all that being said, also uh, as we'll we'll continue to talk about this Rays game and take your calls up until uh, 1130, uh, the defensive alignment for the Rays, it was Austin Meadows DHing, which was nice to kind of get him eased back, giving him a nice half day off is what they say in the biz. It was Brandon Lau in right field. Uh, Yanni Diaz at third, Choi playing first base, Wendell at second, Yoshi in left, Adamas at short, Kiermaier in center, and of course Michael Perez catching. So that's the way uh, the defense lined up. Inning by inning breakdown. And again, please feel free. I got a couple of messages yesterday. When was the right time to call in? Anytime. Please feel free to interrupt me. I am totally good. 352 639 is the number to call. We go to the top of the first inning, and this this is where things already got started off. It was uh, Meadows. He had a decent at bat, saw about five pitches, and flew out to center. It was pretty deep out toward the triangle. Brandon Lau hits a single, and then Yandy Diaz gets on base. It was a funky play where the baseball, I, I, I believe, bounced off the first base bag. So he gets on, and it's first and third there with one out. Choi then walks to load the bases, and it was Joey Wendell who comes up to the plate, and you think, oh, maybe you get a base hit. Uh, drive in two. No, it was a weak ground ball that could have easily been turned uh, for two, that, and that would have ended I would have ended the inning and no runs. Uh, of course, with the one out and the double play. Uh, but it gets stuck in the mitt of Michael Chavis in the webbing. Uh, the ball got stuck in there, and he couldn't pull it out, and he had to eat the play and just jog over to the first base bag. Uh, so Joy Wendell and the Rays catch a break there. They get on on the board there with the, the Wendell RBI. And then Yoshi flies out to end the inning. And uh, we head to the bottom of the first, and this was the ma- one of the main stories, especially when it was 8 nothing. This was going to be the main storyline that I was going to talk about. Blake Snell on the mound tonight. They wanted to get him five innings or about 75 pitches, whichever uh, came first, and they ended up meeting both of those. Blake Snell goes five innings pitched, no earned runs, only four hits, no walks. He struck out six, looked really good. 70 pitches, 48 were for strikes. Uh, got his first win of the season, so congrats to Snell. Um, look good. The fastball is working and he, the off speed stuff is running really good. Again, he struck out a lot of prominent Yankees hitters in his last start and doing more of the same against Boston tonight. Uh, you think 70 pitches and might take him a couple more starts to get fully stretched out, but that efficiency, 70 pitches getting him five innings is good. And obviously once he's fully stretched out, if you can give him that efficiency, I mean, heck you're going maybe six or seven innings into a ball game, which the way the bullpen is right now, and uh, Steven mentioned that a, a few minutes ago, they're going to have to be creative with the bullpen. They're going to have to call some guys up, some unproven minor leaguers, maybe some free agent signings just to fill holes. Again, Andrew Kittredge on the 45-day injury list with a, a, a sprain in his right UCL. If you're unfamiliar with that, it's a ligament in the elbow, and that's 
what the Tommy John surgery repairs when the UCL is torn. Thankfully, Kit, uh, the diagnosis right now is that it was just a sprain, but he's going to miss some significant time. And of course, with a 45-day IL, you assume that's the remainder of the season. He closed out uh, Monday night's win and started um, uh, the next day. And I mean, it's easy to point to that's why he had pitched a, a couple back-to-backs with only one day in between going into that. So he had been taxed. Uh, to Kevin Cash's credit, I think he was trying to... Andrew Kidrick has not been a great pitcher for the Rays by any means, and Kit had really found a groove. And I think Kevin Cash just wanted to ride that momentum and keep Kittredge's confidence up and, and kind of keep him rolling. And of course, with the way the bullpen has been at times this year, if you have a guy that's rolling, stick with him. And I, I'm not going to I'm not gonna slam him uh, because we're not doctors. We don't know if that if the stress was what caused it. I saw a, a piece, there was a piece that was brought up on the uh, Atlantic about eight years ago about a certain style of pitching. Uh, and, and that is the way Kittredge pitches. He throws the elbows kind of up in the air like a, in a debut shape, and that's what they're saying is, is really bad for the elbow. So that, that could be a part of it. There, I mean, there's a, a myriad of factors, but bottom line, uh, Andrew Kittredge is out. They called up Aaron Sleggers, who went two innings pitch, but we'll tell you about that uh, a little bit later. So where we are in the bottom of the first, it was a leadoff single uh, for Kevin Pillar, he went four for five tonight. A very nice uh, leadoff hitting performance for him. Um, and Blake Snell, 10 pitches, and he didn't record an out. You're thinking, oh boy, here we go again. The bullpen is already taxed uh, to its limits. How much far? How much more of this game can we play? Uh, but then he settles down, gets a double play ball, and easily gets out of the inning. Only throws four more pitches. Uh, so 14 pitches in the first inning. We go to the top of the second. It was Adamas leading it off. His first home run of the year, and it's 2 nothing race. So that was good to see for Willie have some pop at the bottom of the order. Goes 1-4 for four tonight um, with that solo home run. He's now batting 255, which is right around where he was last year. He's on base, is 345. So you like what he's doing. He's playing better defense at shortstop. So I think uh, he's a valuable asset to the race right now, uh, of course. And then Kiermaier and Perez both strike out. And and this is where it got really interesting. Austin Meadows hit a, a, a kind of a, a, a baseball that fell in in deep right. Uh, really should have been caught, I believe. It was um, Kevin Pillar came in from right, and then uh, Jackie Bradley Jr. in center. They kind of got mixed up, and the ball kind of plopped in. You were thinking, oh, man, on first, two outs, uh, maybe that, that was just a fluke, and they'll get out of the inning. No, Brandon Lau gives up. Uh, or I'm sorry, Brandon Lau hits a two-run homer. That was his fourth of the year, also his 13th run batted in. He leads the race in both of those categories right now. Uh, so then all of a sudden, that made it a 4 nothing raise, I believe. Yeah, so all of a sudden, yeah, the ball game is getting out of reach. Godley uh, had already thrown 40 pitches at that point. The Rays were really making him work. And then that they, the inning ended shortly thereafter. Um there was not much that happened in the bottom of the second. There was a cross-up um, on a two-out play with Snell and Perez. I'm not sure who was at fault, um, but that there it was. Uh, Yandy Diaz uh, could have made a play to get an out, but it ends up being a single. Um, so that it basically just drove up uh, Blake Snell's pitch count. He was at, I believe, around 30 pitches through two. So with 15 pitches or so, the pacing was nice, much better than it was his last time out. Um, against the Yankees top of the third it was G-Man Choi getting a leadoff double off the wall so that was nice to see for him and then Yoshi Satsugo as we said uh, his second home run of the year in the first since opening day so obviously you feel good about Satsugo and again the the great play defensively and left a diving uh, stop so uh, Yoshi Satsugo is is pretty hot right now and hopefully he'll continue that way and again that that diving play was in the bottom of the third uh, and that was when the Kevin Pillar uh, strike tried to stretch the single into a double and it was a laser of a throw by Kevin Kiermeyer. And at the end of three, Blake Snell had thrown forty one pitches and at that point it was six to nothing race. So at that point the only real concern was just getting Blake Snell his innings and his pitch count and continuing uh for him to look good. Top of the fourth Meadows works a leadoff walk, which is exactly what you want um for the leadoff hitter in the number one spot tonight. Uh, Brandon Lau hits a double that would have been a home run in some other parks they mentioned on the broadcast. It was a really high off the wall double. Um, and then it was Yandy Diaz with a single, knocks in a run. So at that point, it's 7 nothing Rays. 
um, is they take out Zach Godley. So his line, he takes the loss tonight. He's now 0-2. He goes three innings pitch, gives up eight runs on 10 hits, walks two, strikes out three, gives up three home runs. The Rays would hit another, uh, their fourth homer of the game. He throws only 74 pitches, 45 of which were for strikes, and his ERA has ballooned up to 816. That's about uh, a whole five points. I believe his ERA was about under four going into that start. So the race knocked him out early, and that's what uh, Kevin Cash had mentioned in the pregame was they like the matchups against a guy like a godly, a kind of a soft-tossing righty. They haven't been good against the soft-tossing lefties, but they got to Zach Godley, the right-handed pitcher, t- uh, tonight, which was good to see. Um, and then it was they bring in Ryan Weber, who's a local Clearwater St. Pete product, went to CCC. Um, and it, today was his 30th birthday as well. He gets the bulk. He, he finishes the last six innings of this game and with only 58 pitches thrown. So not too bad of an outing for him. Only gives up one earned run in the process. So really a nice outing uh, for him. And then uh, G-Man Choi grounds into a double play, uh, but with no outs, it knocks in another run. So at that point, it is 8 nothing. Rays, bottom of the fourth. Uh, Michael Prez missed a block on a strikeout. It was ruled a wild pitch, but the runner gets to first. Again, this is all just to point out that you know it brought up Blake Snell's pitch count a little bit. Bogart single, so it's first and second with one out. Again, the Rays are up 8 nothing, so it's not a big deal. But can Blake Snell get out of the gym? He gets a flyout and a strikeout. Uh, only got out of the inning with, again, 19 pitches, which was good. He had 55 pitches at that point through four. So, again, the pacing was still good. Top of the fifth, it was the first scoreless inning of the night for the Rays. They go down easy. That was when Ryan Weber was getting into his groove. I'll just give you Weber's line here before we head to a break. Weber goes six innings pitch, gives up five hits, uh, just an earned run, no walks, four strikeouts, and gave up um a solo home run as we are creeping right up uh, right here at 11 o'clock, final 30 minutes of the show. When we return during the break, you can call the show. and That would be a great time uh, to do so at 352-639-0036. Here is the update. HBC. Several MLB games that have already gone final, the first of which the Cubs 7-2 over the Indians. In uh, Anaheim, it's the Athletics 8-4 over the Angels. The Diamondbacks winning 13-7 over the Rockies. First place and a West Rockies, by the way. Also final, the White Sox 7-5 over the Tigers. Of course, Rays 9-5 over the Red Sox. The Mets win 11-6 with an, over the Nationals using an opener. The Twins 12-2 over the Brewers. The Astros final 5-1 over the Giants. The Orioles win 5-4 over the Phillies. Uh, the Royals have a 5-4 to four win over the Reds in some games currently in action. In the top of bottom of the 10th, it is the Marlins up 14-11 to 11 on the Blue Jays. In Buffalo, in the bottom of the 8th, it is the Yankees 6, Braves 3. Uh, bottom of the 6th, Mariners up 4 nothing on the Rangers. And in the 5th, it is the Padres and Dodgers scoreless. Don't go anywhere. Hey, sports fans. William's currently in the can, but he'll be right back. We're currently on a commercial break, so don't touch that dial. Remember, you can call us at 352-639-0036 or drop us a line on Twitter at WHBC Stream to tell us what's on your mind. We want to talk sports. We want to get unruly. We want you to tell us what you think so we can argue. Anyway... When all that's said and done, please stay tuned for William's world-famous Around the XFL podcast and other projects that he's currently got in the works. Please visit whbcstream.com, and thanks again for listening in.
HBC. And at 11.02, we are back on the William Haynes Show, final 30 minutes of the program. Sorry for anyone that got mixed up during the break. Uh, the, the audio I just found out went dead instead of turning off, instead of muting the microphone on the computer to avoid the annoying mouse click, I just hit the mute button on the, on the mic, but little did I know that muting the microphone would mute also, uh, the commercial music. So, uh, no, we did not go away. We are still on the air taking your calls, uh, for about another 27 minutes. Uh, the number to call again, three, five, two, six, three, nine, zero, zero, three, six. We would love nothing more. Uh, then to hear from you, we also have um, an interview that we did with NHL correspondent Aaron. We'll give you that after we finish up the Rays game. So definitely make sure to give us a call um, here shortly. Again, the number to call 352-639-0036 as we return. Talking about the Rays game when we went on break, the Rays were up 8 to nothing, and Snell had gotten through 3 um, with relative ease. Actually, had gotten through 4, um, excuse me. So... Uh, top of the fifth, it was uh, the first scoreless inning of the night for the Rays. And then the bottom of the fifth, it was a 1-2-3 inning. Um, or I'm sorry, I got, it, I got it all mixed up. Bottom of the seventh, it was 1-2-3 inning for Snell. And um, that put him at 70 pitches. Top of the sixth, the Rays go down in order 1-2-3 again. Again, Weber had worked into a nice groove. And bottom of the sixth, this was... Um, when they take out Blake Snell, again, the line, he goes five innings pitched, no earned runs on four hits, no walks, six strikeouts, 70 pitches, 48 strikes. So they take him out. They bring in Aaron Sleggers. Sleggers, um, the man that was brought up to the big league club um, by, with the room that was made by uh, Andrew Kittredge being sent to the injured list. Sleggers we were told was ready to go about four or five innings. He was stretched out um, a little bit about Sluggers that I found out. Uh, he was pitched for the Twins in the big leagues from 17 to 18. He was traded to the Rays during the 19th season, but did uh, he never reached the big leagues for the Rays, uh, just some minor league appearances. In the big leagues going into tonight, he was 1-2 and two with a 5.63 ERA, and he had only struck out 15 batters. Uh, but the Rays are up 8 nothing. What's the worst that can happen? You just need bulk innings. And he gave them two tonight. Um, when he first comes in, uh, also of note, uh, his dad was is 7 feet tall. Sluggers himself is 6 foot 10. So if there's any organization that would help him develop, it would be uh, the Rays. Of course, we know from Tyler Glasnow, I believe, is also 6 foot 10. Kyle Snyder, the pitching coach, is, I believe, that height height as well. So if there's anyone that knows how to groom these tall pitchers, again, things get a little weird with the mechanics and everything. Uh, Sluggers did not has, have the fastball that, that Glasnow does, but but you get the point. Um, he comes in. Sluggers gets a leadoff single, so not, that's not great for the confidence. Devers, a fielder's choice, and then he gets a ground out and then another out to end the inning. So no harm done. And we go to the top of the seventh. It was a 1-2-3 inning um, with a double play. And then in the bottom of the seventh, it was Sleggers getting a, another 1-2-3 inning. Just checking the audio there. I wanted to make sure uh, that everything was okay with that. I believe we are still doing okay um, as far as the audio goes. We have uh, people saying that it's out, so... Uh, as far as I know, the audio should be good to go. Um, I'll check that uh, during the next break in about 15 minutes or so. We'll give you uh, the hockey scores uh, today. So but at, at the end of seven, it was 8 nothing Rays. Lake Snell had given them five clean sluggers, had been rolling with two. In the, the eighth inning, the Rays go down in order again. One, two, three, Weber. Again, a really nice groove he worked himself into. And the bottom of the eighth inning was when things got very very interesting it was three straight singles to load the bases a lot of 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 weekly hit kind of ground balls but they got through the hole it was an rbi single that made it eight to one or eight to one yeah and then it was jd martinez blasting a grand slam and before you know it it was eight to five so a whole new ball a whole new ball game uh the approach to everything totally changes an infield single um which was uh the sixth hit sixth straight hit in the inning, so the Rays uh, kind of delay things, take Sleggers out. They bring in Nick Anderson. Uh, Aaron Sleggers, his line finishes with two innings pitched. 
gives up five earned runs on seven hits, a strikeout, and again, that home run, 47 pitches, 35 are for strikes, and in his first big league appearance of the year, he now has a 22.50 ERA. Uh, but as we said uh, with Steven on the call there, it was a good um, first two innings, and even though we it was advertised that he was ready to go four or five, I think two uh, was where the race should have drawn the line. Again, trying to just work him into the big leagues. This is not Port Charlotte against minor leaguers. I, I think some some other pitchers that the Rays have brought up this year have kind of struggled with the same thing. Although uh, John Curtis uh, pitched pretty well in his couple of outings, so um, who knows? So they take out Sluggers, put Anderson in. The situation is one on with nobody out. It was an eight to five ball game. So I mean, this is a safe situation. They bring in Anderson. Um, in the high leverage spot, um, and it was um, they they bring in Anderson. It was a Vasquez strikeout, a Chavis strikeout. Verdugo singles, which brings the tying run to the plate in Jackie Bradley Jr. and he gets JVJ to ground out. Um, so a couple of strikeouts. He looked really good. That's what Nick Anderson does is put out the flames. Um, so it, at, at the end of eight, it was eight to five Rays, and you think how are the Rays? Going to get a ninth inning uh, cleanly. The Red Sox were storming back. Top of the ninth inning, it was Austin Meadows hitting his first home run of the season that made it 9-5 to five race. A really good sight uh, for him in the leadoff spot. He goes 2-4, for four, scores three times. One was on a walk and a, a, a run knocked in. On the solo shot, they get Yandy Diaz uh, on and they pinch run with him with Margot, but they can't get anything else uh, going in that inning. And in the ninth, they bring in Fairbanks. So uh, Anderson just pitched that eighth inning. He finishes with an inning pitched, gives up only a hit, two strikeouts, throws 12 pitches, 11 of which were for strikes. The fastball was working right where he wanted him. Uh, but he's pitched the last two days. So unfortunately, obviously in a game that was once 8 nothing, uh, it was unfortunate that they had used Anderson. And that's really um, whatever the opposite of a silver lining is, if you want to pick out the negatives in a, in a good win. Uh, it would be exactly that is that they had to burn up Anderson, but thankfully they were able to get a clean ninth, not a safe situation, but a clean ninth from Peter Fairbanks, who comes in, gets Peraza to ground out. Pilar, who was four for four going into that at bat, a fear, Fairbanks strikes him out, and then Aroiz grounds out to first base uh, for a Rays win. Again, the Rays advance to 11 and 8. Um, on the season, they win 9 to 5 over the Red Sox, draw Boston to 6 and 12. A couple of notes that I accumulated over the course of the game. They clinched the series, obviously, four home runs. It was the race fifth straight win, the longest win streak of the season. They now three games over 500, which is the high water mark so far. Um, uh, they are four and one against Boston so far this year, and I believe the sixth straight win at Fenway Park dating back to last year, and it was uh, the race seven and one in Boston. Uh, a year ago, which was the most a team had won in, in Fenway in over, I believe, 100 years. It was like the 1915 uh, Orioles, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so here, um, th the number to call if you want to talk anything raised is 352-639-0036. Hopefully you can hear me. I've been told that I'm having some audio issues. Hopefully not. Um, that would be a shame if this whole thing um, was all for naught. But as far as we know, uh, we should be on the air and again the number to call is 352-639-0036 we're actually going to take um actually no we're not going to take the break we're going to give you the nhl report uh this was something that was already pre-recorded with nhl correspondent of the show aaron and without further ado all right and on the william haynes show we are joined by friend of the program aaron who is the show's nhl correspondent we thank you uh, joining the show today to talk some NHL hockey. Of course, a lot has gone on since this whole thing got started, mainly the qualifying rounds. We weren't exactly accurate on our predictions, but then again, not not a lot of people were. Look at a series like um, maybe the Penguins and Canadians. I mean, who who could have guessed Montreal was going to come through in that series? Like nobody. <laughs> All um, the professionals have to win. And also, as we look at the Eastern Conference, the Hurricanes and Rangers, we had the Rangers. I think a lot of people did. What was it for the Rangers that kept them from winning that series? They didn't look good. It was a three-game sweep. 
Yeah, um, I wouldn't say goaltending was really the issue. Lundqvist played great in game one. It wasn't as good in game two, but, like, the offense just wasn't there. Yeah. And wasn't goalie can't do everything on that. Yeah, that's defense true. Defense didn't really help. Yeah, for an offense that had been so great towards the end of the regular season, yeah, certainly, I mean, not that the Hurricanes, I guess, are a premier team, but they shut them down. The one that we did get right, the Islanders, uh, the Panthers didn't look great on all phases. I think the Islanders are going to be a team to watch out for just because of how good their defense is and can shut down. Certainly not a team that you want to see probably the Lightning play. No, not especially after how they played them in the regular season this year. They They don't play that kind of system too well. Yeah. Um, also in the East, there was a Maple Leafs and Blue Jackets series. That one just got kind of weird. The Leafs made it interesting towards the end, but ultimately it was Columbus coming through. And in the West, there's not a whole lot to talk about. I guess the main point is the Oilers fell to the 12 seed Blackhawks. Did anything stand out to you in that series? Yeah. Um, Crawford played well. Kubelik. I mean, we know he was good during the regular season. I just didn't think that they would be able to withstand the Oilers, but, well, clearly they did. Yeah, and then we move over to the f- real first round of the playoffs. Of course, the Lightning is the main thing that stands out. Yesterday's game one win took about six hours and five overtimes to get through it. It ultimately ended in a 3-2 to two Lightning win. That So much that happened. What was the takeaways from, from you in that game? Uh, the Lightning just stayed with it. They didn't stray away from their game plan like they usually would have in the years prior, and it, it ended up working out. Yeah, it was. It, I was surprised to see Hedman play as much as he did, of course, coming back from that weird rolling of the ankle in the last game against the Flyers. He came in and played like 50, I think it was 56 or 57 minutes. And then with Stamkos, do we know what's going on with Stammer right now? Is he going to appear in the series at any point? Uh, well, he was in their locker room celebrating the win. That's about all we know for that. So, uh, winning a game, obviously, against Columbus in in the playoffs is good. Finally, it was about 16 months too late. Where the series stands right now, I mean, do you think the Lightning have the advantage that they're going to be able to pull this one out? I think they have a good shot. As long as they keep playing like they did in game one, maybe score a little bit sooner. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Corpus Salo is going to be the real X factor in this series. If he keeps playing like he did, it'll be tough, but I think they can get it done. All right, and we move over to the rest of the playoff picture. We'll stay with the East. Hopefully the, the Lightning will prevail over Columbus. Uh, the Flyers and Montreal, I believe it'll be game one tonight. Obviously the Flyers the favorite, but do you think Montreal can keep things rolling with Carey Price and company? Oh, I think it'll be a good series. Um, well, hopefully the game's tonight with how it's gone yesterday. Who knows at this point? Yeah, yeah, that's true. The games in Toronto have been getting postponed and moved over and all that. Uh, the Capitals and Islanders, that's going to be a really good series as well. Do the Capitals still have mm-hmm. it in them to win a series against a tough team like the Islanders? I, I still think the Capitals can do it. It's going to be a long one. I think I got them in seven on my bracket. Okay, so yeah, a good series. For sure, the Islanders look to grit out another series. And then the Bruins and Hurricanes, we saw um, earlier this morning, it was the Bruins prevailing in double overtime. Uh, Does Boston have the edge in this series? Do you think they're going to be able to pull it out? As much as I would like the Carolina Hurricanes to win, I just it's going to be a tough series. I mean, they got Dougie Hamilton back, but they they still lost. But they played good. I think they might be able to pull it out if they are consistent. All right, and in the Western Conference, Game 1 was last night. It was the the number one seed Golden Knights over the Blackhawks. The Blackhawks, a team that really surprised to even be in that spot. Do you think they're just going to get swept out pretty quick by uh, the number one seed Vegas? I don't think it'll be a sweep, but it's going to be a good series. Game one kind of went how I thought. I I think Vegas is going to end up winning in like five or six. Um, If Chicago, because Edmonton and Vegas are pretty similar. So it's going to be a pretty good series either way, but I still have Vegas winning. All right. And in the West, not a whole lot more that stands out. The Avalanche and Coyotes, you think maybe Colorado will take that one pretty easily? 
Yeah, I have it. I think it's going to be like a five or a six. Uh, Arizona, the goalie can do a lot, but uh, Colorado is just going to be too much to handle in the long run. And what about the Stars and the Flames? Well, I didn't get to watch any of that game yesterday because it started and finished before the Lightning one. Yeah, <laughs> how incredible! But is that? Uh, yeah, I I just don't like the Stars right now. They didn't look good in the exhibition and the round robin, and they kind of continued into game one. They really got to figure it out fast if they're going to stay alive in this. Yeah, that, that's kind of something that, I, that I've been talking a lot about. A team like the Flames had to grit out the qualifying round series to even punch their ticket versus a team, like you say, with the Stars that, you know, a little bit lackadaisical, hasn't really had to play a competitive game. They did the exhibition, and again, the round robins, they weren't. Uh, successful in and now they're they're playing a team in the flames no pun intended that are are coming in quite hot and they took game one Mm -hmm. yesterday and just one other series the uh, reigning champion blues over the canucks do the the st louis blues continue their title defense uh i think they can get through the first round it's going to be a good series yeah yeah the whole tendon can stay hot or become hot when it matters most do you know, like like managing a guy like Victor Hedman's injury as we move over to the Lightning a little bit, with him playing as many minutes as he did, how do you manage that with only one day's rest in between and playing five periods of overtime? Do you just plan it and play, give regular minutes? Uh, yeah, well, because I know today is a rest day. <laughs> right. Uh, they, they've been pretty happy to post that on Instagram. <laughs> So as long as he's as long as he wants to keep going out there, just throw him out there as much as he wants and just let it go. And if it keeps working, just let it go. Yeah, that's what they did for. Dylan. Hopefully, if they keep winning, they can just keep Stamkos on the bench. But I'm hoping if they need him, he'll be available at some point. That's about all we have right now. Thank you for coming on the show and giving us a little bit of your time mm-hmm. today. Yep, no problem. And we thank Aaron, the show's uh, NHL correspondent, giving us a little bit of his time, giving us a little bit of briefing on what's gone down in the NHL playoffs. And speaking of the NHL, we're going to head to another 2020 sports break, give you the hockey scores from today. And when we come back, final 10 minutes of the program, we would love to hear from you. Of course, if you're listening, the the number to call during the break is 352-639-0036. HBC... Most of playoff hockey action has gone final. The Flyers with a 2-1 win over the Canadians. They take Game 1. And another Game 1, the Avalanche 3-0 over the Coyotes. The Islanders 4-2 over the Capitals. In two overtimes, a game that had to be pushed to this morning because of last night's 5-overtime Lightning and Columbus game. It was the Bruins 4-3 over the Hurricanes. Again, that one went to double overtime in the only game currently in action with four minutes left in the first period. It is the Canucks up one nothing on the reigning champion St. Louis Blues. Hey sports fans, William's currently in the can, but he'll be right back. We're currently on a commercial break, so don't touch that dial. Remember, you can call us at 352-639-0036 or drop us a line on Twitter at WHBC Stream to tell us what's on your mind. We want to talk sports. We want to get unruly. We want you to tell us what you think so we can argue. Anyway, when all that's said and done, please stay tuned for Williams World Famous Around the XFL podcast and other projects that he's currently got in the works. Please visit WHBCStream.com And thanks again for listening in.
HBC. And at 11.22, we are back on the William Haynes Show. Remember, in the remainder of the program, you can call the show at 352-639-0036. We would love uh, to hear from you. Here, maybe we've been having some audio issues. I'll look, go back and uh, check that. Apologies. And Well, I guess you, you wouldn't be able to hear me if there was uh, some issues. But I guess we can wrap the show with uh, kind of previewing tomorrow's game. It will be uh, Tyler Glasnow, v, um, a player making his first ever big league appearance, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it is at 4.30 tomorrow, so a bit of a getaway day. Kyle Hart the left-handed pitcher going for the Red Sox. I would imagine with that being his first big league or appearance at least of the year, I'm assuming that is an opener, but against the left-handed pitcher, maybe the the Rays will stack the righties. And for the Rays, it is Tyler Glasnow on the season. Glasnow is 0-1 with a 5.56 ERA in 11 and third innings pitched. Uh, as we take a look at his uh, starts so far, first start of the year, he goes four innings pitch against the Braves. Uh, four and two thirds against the Orioles, and in a doubleheader, seven inning doubleheader against the Yankees, it goes two and two thirds. Uh, we look at the pitch counts for those games, respectively, 72, 88, and 71. So uh, I'm thinking he's built up pretty full right now. That's at least the word. Uh, so hopefully, getting six innings, five or six innings is what I would expect um, out of Glass now. Now, it is going to be difficult to see how they. They run the lineup. I remember the last time against the opener a couple days ago, I think they, they stacked, I believe, the lefties because they have guys that can mix both. Usually against a left-handed starter, they'll go about seven righties and two lefties um, and, and invert that depending on which you know which pitcher um, it is. Kyle Hart, I don't know a lot about him. Of course, we don't have – ESPN has absolutely nothing about him. Um, so maybe just a guy that's in there to get an inning or two. We would love to see the Rays get some more first-inning runs as that set the tone tonight. Um, for a really nice game. And as far as uh, the bullpen is concerned, I'll take a look at guys the Rays might be able to use. Um, who would I would expect? Ryan Thompson should be good to go. Diego Castillo. Um, Nick Anderson is on a back-to-back, so um, I would scratch him out uh, for tomorrow. Peter Fairbanks pitched tonight, but he's not on a back-to-back, so maybe we would see Fairbanks. Uh, Chaz Rowe. Jalen Beeks could be available for a couple of innings. I would expect to see Jalen Beeks because it's been a while and you got to keep him uh, fresh. Uh, obviously, you you want to give guys days off, but it gets to a point where you you you, you need to give guys time uh, to get them some game action. Um, so I'd ex- expect to see a couple from Beeks. I was honestly anticipating that to follow Snell, but they go with uh, Aaron Slagers, who didn't exactly pan out, but I guess they wanted to get a look at him. They may end up, in all honesty, with how many options he's got left, probably sent him down after this start. I haven't seen any word on that and trying to get up another pitcher. Uh, so Jalen Beeks probably to follow Glass now. Trevor Richards pitched four innings on Sunday, so he's on three days rest. He could be a guy that could get an inning, maybe. And then Aaron Loop and Jose Alvarado uh, are some other candidates. Uh, those are... Alvarado was uh, his day of rest today was coming off of a back to back, so you would think he might be ready to go. Um, so again, guys that could follow Glasnow, I would expect Beeks for one or two. So hopefully, line it up. Maybe Glasnow gets you through five or six, um, and then Beeks maybe giving you one or two. So that, that, at that point, you're in the seventh inning or so, and then you can line it up. Ryan Thompson, Diego Castillo, Aaron Loop, uh, Chaz Rowe. They've got plenty of options. A bullpen, I think, is in decent. A bit of shape. They'll get a day off on Monday. Uh, a programming update. I will be on the air tomorrow at 9 o'clock sharp. Of course, we're not going to be on right after the Rays game because uh, that'll probably get through at maybe 7 or 8 or so. Um, so we'll be on at 9 o'clock sharp. Um, and we will not be back on the air again after that until next Tuesday. We won't be on the air, of course, during the weekend or Friday or the following Monday. We are moving, packing up the WHBC studios about four hours north here, moving from Clearwater uh, to Tallahassee, the state capital. I'm starting my academic career at FSU. Um, so we're going to move the studio up there. going to take s- some days off to get settled in. But we will be back uh, next Tuesday uh, recapping hopefully a Rays win in the Bronx over the Yankees as that will be the first game um, of that series. So again, tomorrow we will be on the air at 9 o'clock. 
hopefully talking another raised win over the Boston Red Sox. Final three minutes of the program. If we have anyone listening, uh, the number to call is 352-639-0036. Don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll stay on a couple extra minutes for you. There's no concern about that. We'd love to hear your thoughts. We had Steven uh, from North Carolina call in uh, tonight, and we really appreciate his call. He was very nice. We had Seth uh, last night. So uh, really appreciate the calls. Appreciate all the support of the people that have been listening to the program. It's really been a delight to be on the air uh, for about an hour or two each night after these Rays games. I've really had a blast doing it, and I've hoped that you enjoy um, listening in as I'm <laughs> as I'm kind of ad-libbing uh, for the final last couple minutes of the program, just allowing maybe some more phone calls uh, to flood in. We'll really take an in-depth look uh, tomorrow, previewing all the games that we're going to miss uh, but as it looks now, uh, tomorrow will be Tyler Glasnow uh, v. Uh, Hart of the Red Sox. And then after that, they go on the road up to Buffalo for a three-game set. Friday, Saturday, Sunday series with the Blue Jays. No set, set, no set starter for the Rays on Friday. Imagine some sort of an opener day as that was, uh, that would have been um, Yanni Chirinos' spot. And on Friday, they'll be taking on Tanner Rourke. Of the Blue Jays on Saturday, it'll be Ryan Yarbrough v. Tanner Anderson. And on Sunday, no pitcher announced. That's uh, Charlie Morton's uh, spot against Matt Shoemaker. So they're going to have to string together probably a couple opener days, which is why it is so crucial for Glasnow start tomorrow and Ryan Yarbrough uh, his start on Saturday to really get some length. Both of those guys are fully stretched out, the only two of which that are that way in the rotation. Yanni Chirinos. Uh, they expect back next Thursday off the IL when he's active. Um, no set starter as that is Torino's his spot. I'm not sure they would want to have him first game back in the Bronx against the Yankees on Thursday, but he'll be activated, they expect. And then Charlie Morton, I believe, is only going to do the 10 days. He's not going to need a rehab assignment as they just wanted to give him a little bit of a rest. And the, the reason for putting him on the IL is just to bring uh, someone else up, I believe, you know, just bring up another pitcher. Uh, because they they sorely need arms right now. Tonight was a good sight for Blake Snell, I think. Uh, They got five innings clean out of him at only 70 pitches. So uh, you you like his progress, really getting stretched out. Three innings last start against the Yankees. Hopefully in the next couple starts, he'll be fully stretched out and hopefully back to his former Cy Young form again. We'll be on the air tomorrow, 9 o'clock sharp. Thank you for everyone that listened and everyone that called in. Really had a blast. Uh, doing that tomorrow again it is Tyler Glasnow v. Uh, uh, an opener day of sorts against the Red Sox relievers to maybe to go Thompson Castillo Loop maybe Alvarado and then Chaz Rowe and Jalen Beek so they have guys that they can line up um, so yeah again we'll be on there at 9 o'clock after the game and we will see you then HBC.